Now that we've rebuilt the front brake calipers and we're at least pretty confident in the front half of the brake system, we'll go ahead and rebuild the master cylinder. As mentioned previously, for this particular car, this master cylinder is available from a rebuilder so cheaply that it's not really practical to rebuild them yourself. Although in this particular case we got a really good deal on a rebuild kit, so it will be at least a little bit cheaper. Still, it's not generally going to be worth your time on a car like this, but it's good to know how these things work for older cars with harder to find parts. We'll get started by breaking loose the two flare nuts holding the brake lines into the master cylinder. At this point, the master cylinder is pretty empty, but we'll still try to keep the fluid from dripping since it's very damaging to paint. These lines and flare nuts aren't rusty, but this front one was pretty darn stuck. This is one of the situations where you definitely want to use flare nut wrenches to decrease the odds of rounding off any parts. And with both of those connections loose, we'll remove the two nuts holding the master cylinder to the brake booster. The driver's side came loose easily, although it took a little bit of determination to get the impact gun on the passenger side nut. Would it have been easier and taken less time to just use a normal wrench? Absolutely. Eventually we solved that puzzle and the brake master cylinder is now loose. We'll loosen off the flare nuts the rest of the way by hand, and slide the master cylinder off of the studs. The combination valve bracket also uses those studs, so we'll have to pull it out of the way just a little bit. Since the system was pretty thoroughly empty by this point, we didn't have any drips. And especially with the master cylinder removed, it's plainly obvious that the front of the master cylinder is for the drum brakes, and the rear is for the discs. We can also tell this because the reservoir is larger in the rear due to disc brake pistons having a larger surface area and therefore needing a larger volume of fluid to function. And here we are, back on the bench with our master cylinder. While we're here, we'll give it a little bit of extra cleaning and get out the last little bit of fluid that's still in the reservoir. At this point, it occurred to us that the master cylinder rebuild kit we had bought did not include new grommets for the brake fluid reservoir. We gave a little bit of a half-hearted attempt to remove it, and then decided to just leave it in place and not risk breaking anything. The plastic reservoir is really just held on by barbs that fit inside the grommets, so pulling up on it and prying on it should be able to get it loose, but in this case, since we didn't have to do it, I'd rather not risk anything. And since we're leaving that in place, we'll get started by removing the lock ring holding in the master cylinder piston assembly. To do this, we'll use a large Phillips screwdriver to compress the piston a little bit and use a small flat blade screwdriver to pry the ring out of its groove. And once we've carefully removed the ring, we can release the spring tension on the piston. Then we can just grab the piston, well let's, let's wipe some of that rust off of there, then we can just grab the piston and remove it from its bore. Ooh, that's, yeah that's pretty gooey. That's not really what you want to see inside the master cylinder. Now we'll just go ahead and use a small plastic container to drain the rest of the fluid from the inside of the cylinder. And although it looks quite tempting, do not attempt to taste the forbidden soy sauce. Also, try not to tip it over and make a fool of yourself. If you're following along, so far we removed the primary piston, but there's actually another piston still inside the master cylinder. Only, this one is magic. There's no retaining clip for this one, it's just held in by the seals and a whole lot of gunk. It should be possible to blow the piston out of its bore with compressed air, but that would make a mess and I don't really want to aerosolize brake fluid by doing that. So we'll just use the old fashioned method of prodding the piston and slamming it on the table until it comes loose. And there you go, that is basically all of the major pieces out of our master cylinder. And we can fully appreciate how much gunk had collected inside of it. Some of the buildup is caused by brake fluid deteriorating, some of it is from rust inside of the lines, and some of it is from little bits of rubber coming off of the seals and the insides of the hoses on the braking system. But even if you don't know where it comes from, you probably know that you don't want all this buildup inside of there. Before we do anything else, we'll go ahead and give the pistons a quick wipe down. The rebuild kit includes new seals for the secondary piston and an entirely new primary piston because the spring retainer is crimped on there. And since we'll actually be reusing it, we'll do a much better job of cleaning the secondary piston. We'll also go ahead and pull the spring off of it. After a thorough wipe down, things are starting to look a little bit better and we'll spray some brake cleaner on there to get a little bit more of the residue off. The secondary piston return spring is being reused, so we'll make sure it's as clean as possible. And now that we have our slightly cleaned secondary piston, we need to go ahead and get the seals off of it. The front piston seal is this cup seal. It's held in place and protected from the spring by this steel retainer. The retainer is friction fit with these little tabs that are bent inward. 
To remove it, we'll use flat blade screwdrivers prying up around the edge to lift it up a little bit at a time. We'll travel around the perimeter of the retainer so that we're lifting it as straight up as possible and not just digging it into the aluminum piston. And after about a minute of this dance, we were able to get the retainer loose. And with that set aside, we can easily remove the cup seal. As for the front piston seal, we'll just use an o-ring pick to pry it out of its groove. And we'll make sure to keep track of the install orientation of these seals. And that's the secondary piston disassembled. And that's pretty much it. All that's left to do is to clean the parts. We took another whack at removing the reservoir from the master cylinder, but it just seemed like it wasn't going to happen. We really don't need to take it off, and we don't have new grommets for it anyway, so once again we decided to err on the side of caution and not risk breaking it by trying to take it off. So we'll just clean it up as best we can with that still in place. But since we're not removing the reservoir, we're also not removing the quick take-up valve. You'll notice in the drum brake section of the brake fluid reservoir, you're just seeing straight through to the aluminum of the master cylinder housing. However, on the disc brake side, there's a plastic piece showing between the reservoir and the cylinder housing. What you're seeing is the top of the quick take-up valve. For a very brief explanation, quick take-up valves are used in low-drag disc brake systems. With low-drag disc brakes, which the front of this car is equipped with, the piston seal inside each brake caliper will spring back a little bit when the pedal is released, pulling the brake pads a little bit away from the rotor. Therefore, there's a little bit less rolling resistance and a little bit less wear on the braking parts. But that also means that every time the brakes are applied, the pads will have to travel that little bit of extra distance quickly in order to apply the brakes quickly and make the braking system feel firm. It provides a larger volume of fluid as the pedal is first depressed in order to close that gap. The valve itself is fairly simple, but it would still be a good idea to get it as clean as possible. On some models of Master Cylinder, the valve is not removable or serviceable. I'm not sure whether or not it can be easily removed from this Master Cylinder, since I've seen some diagrams showing it as non-serviceable, and one diagram that shows it using a lock ring. Either way, we won't be getting to it today, so we'll do our best to make sure everything is clean as possible, but it won't guarantee that everything is immaculate. To clean this out, we'll mostly be using our old friend's brake cleaner and paper towels. The bore of this master cylinder appears pretty much immaculate. Just like for the cylinder walls of an engine, you can get glaze breaking hones for master cylinders. So if the bore's looking worn, it would be a good idea to rehone the cylinder. And again, unless you're rebuilding a lot of master cylinders, it's not the most practical situation when remanufactured units can be gotten for so cheap. In any case, we were able to get the cylinder very clean on the inside, and the walls look good, so we won't need to go any farther with that. What worked well was to use a long flat blade screwdriver and to kind of ball up the end of a paper towel and spin that around in the bore. It's not unlike cleaning a gun barrel, and after a few run-throughs and a few spray-downs with brake cleaner, the paper towels were coming out clean, so it looked like we were in good shape. We took a bit more time to thoroughly clean the secondary piston parts and gave everything on the master cylinder a wipe down both on the inside and the outside. So all our old parts are as clean as we're going to get them, and we'll go ahead and open up our master cylinder rebuild kit. It's worth mentioning that, although this master cylinder was kind of gross on the inside, it still functioned perfectly fine. I didn't notice any issues with the brakes the few times I drove the car. It just seemed like as good a time as any to clean up these parts and rebuild the master cylinder while we were working on making sure the brake system was reliable. So to get started with reassembly, we'll go ahead and spray down the primary piston with brake cleaner and make sure there's no factory assembly or machining oil left on it. So we have all our clean parts laid out on the table. It was at this point that it occurred to me that my master cylinder bleeding plan wasn't actually going to work because this used metric fittings unlike the ones I had made these brake lines for the last time I bled a master cylinder. So how are we going to find lines that have the right fittings? Well, we happen to know where two are that are easily accessible. Well, they're easily accessible, but since we hadn't broken them loose, they're still on there very tight. To give us the best odds, we'll spray some WD-40 on them and bolt the combination valve bracket back up to the brake booster. We'll space the bracket out from the brake booster a little bit since the master cylinder isn't there. Then we'll tighten up the master cylinder nuts just tight enough to hold everything in place. Even with that attached, it was still a big fight and we were bending the bracket. To farther brace the whole thing, we spaced it out against the shock tower with a piece of wood and then we were finally able to break loose one of those flare nuts. And with the rear fitting intimidated by our show of force against the front one, we were able to get that one loose without too much trouble. 
So for reference, this is kind of what we're trying to replicate here. I made these little brake lines to make bleeding the master cylinder on the blazer really easy, but the flare nuts don't match this reservoir so we weren't able to use them. We'll be able to use the short lines we removed from the car in order to bleed everything cleanly and easily. But before we get into that, of course we'll have to get the master cylinder reassembled. Just like with our brake calipers, we'll fill a clean cap with brake fluid. That way we can easily apply some to all of our seals as we assemble our parts. First up, we'll dunk in the front seal for our secondary piston and slide it into place. As mentioned before, make sure it's going on in the same orientation that the old one came off in. With that looking good, we can install the cup seal onto the rear of the piston. But when we go to install the retainer, it's pretty loose and not doing its job anymore. We'll simply use a pair of needle nose pliers to very slightly bend in those tabs to give it a nice tight fit again. We don't want to have to hammer the thing on there, but it shouldn't be moving around either. And once that's nice and tight, we'll also reinstall the secondary piston return spring. Then we'll take our entirely new primary piston assembly and apply brake fluid to both of the seals. And once the whole piston assembly has been thoroughly oiled, we're ready to move on with assembly. To farther help with assembly, we'll pour a little bit of brake fluid inside the master cylinder and swish it all around. Then we'll start assembly by dropping in our secondary piston spring. And next up is our secondary piston valve. We need to make sure the cup seal installs correctly and doesn't get hung up inside of the cylinder. All the brake fluid really helps us out here and we're able to get it installed very easily. Then we'll pour in a little bit more brake fluid and coat the rear part of the master cylinder. And then we'll slide in our new primary piston assembly. We'll press the piston in by hand to make sure the springs are lined up correctly and it's going to go in past the groove. Then we'll grab the new lock ring and use the handle of a ratchet to compress the piston enough to push the lock ring down into its groove and click it into place. And there we go, we can release the piston and the lock ring will hold it in place. And just like that, our master cylinder is now completely reassembled. The next step is to fill the reservoir with fluid and bleed out any air that's inside of the master cylinder. To make this easier, we'll clamp it into the bench vise on one side of the mounting flange. And with that held firmly in place, we'll thread in the small brake lines that we removed from the car. Clearly, these brake lines on their own aren't going to help us out too much. They'll just end up spraying brake fluid in different directions on the bench. We'll tighten down the brake lines enough into the master cylinder that they won't be leaking, and then we'll attach a rubber hose to the end of each line. Brake fluid will absolutely break down vacuum line over time, but since we're just going to be using it for a few minutes, that's not a concern. We also don't need hose clamps or anything since there's not a tremendous amount of pressure involved, and sealing on the flare will be just fine. We'll run the hoses back into the master cylinder so that as we bleed it, the reservoir won't run dry. It's worth noting that you don't actually need a setup like this, and you can bleed a master cylinder by just letting the fluid drain out onto the bench, but it kinda sucks. All we did to hold the vacuum hoses in place was to zip tie them together against the divider. You might notice that the brake hoses are currently reversed, with the front hose feeding the back reservoir, but we'll fix that in a little bit. And now we'll start filling the brake reservoir with clean, new brake fluid. And once there's a decent amount of brake fluid in the reservoir, we'll start depressing the piston to bleed the system. Here we're using the rounded handle of a ratchet to try to prevent doing any damage to the piston. We'll start by pressing in on the piston very slowly. We'll also limit the overall stroke to around an inch. As you can see, as you start to bleed, there are a lot of bubbles coming out of the system. The air coming out is the air that was trapped inside the master cylinder. So what we're looking to do is to pump the master cylinder piston until the bubbles in the brake fluid have completely stopped. Again, it's a good idea to keep the stroke fairly short, as if you push too far you risk damaging the seals. We'll move the piston very slowly and hold it in for a while to make sure all parts of the quick take-up valve have been bled of air. It also helps just to take your time and make sure the system is thoroughly bled before calling it done. After doing this for a little bit, you can see that the brake fluid level has risen due to the brake hoses being reversed. So we'll go ahead and flip those and even out the master cylinder a little bit manually and get back to bleeding. You can see a little bit of crud that's found its way back into the master cylinder reservoir. This is probably from the base of the reservoir around where the grommets attach. Before installing it on the vehicle, we'll do our best to get that out and make sure everything is as clean as possible. But other than that, it looks like we're in good shape, and we're about ready to reinstall the master cylinder onto the car. This would be a good time to remove the bleeding lines and install plugs to the master cylinder to keep everything from leaking all over the place. But once again, I didn't have plugs that fit these threads, so we'll just leave the bleeding lines attached for the moment. 
We'll apply a bit of lithium grease to the tip of the brake booster push rod and slide the master cylinder back into place. With the master cylinder and the combination valve bracket in place, we'll thread on the nuts and tighten it back down. We'll just get them snug for the moment and come back later to tighten them down to 22 foot-pounds. In this case, that later was after the camera battery died so there's no footage of it, so you'll just have to use your imagination. Uh, click! Ah, uh, click! Whew! Now the next step is to get those little brake lines reconnected to the combination valve. This is gonna be a little bit tricky. While they're accessible, we'll go ahead and apply a little bit of anti-seize to the threads of the flare nuts. Then we'll loosen the flare nut from the body of the master cylinder. Once it's loose, we'll hold the finger tightly over that port, trying to keep as little brake fluid as possible from leaking out. Then we'll disconnect the hose, make sure it's drained, and set it aside. Then we'll get the lower flare nut finger tight into the combination valve, and as quickly as possible, open up the port and thread the other fitting into the master cylinder. We'll make sure nothing is dripping, then we'll go ahead and tighten up both of those fittings. It's difficult to use a torque wrench for these, so we'll just tighten them up by feel. And with the front line connected, we'll go ahead and repeat that same procedure to connect the rear line. And pretty soon we had that threaded in as well, and we were able to do it without spilling too much brake fluid. We'll get both ends of that line tightened down, plug back in the pressure differential switch, and, well, we're pretty much good to go. Except, of course, we still have to bleed the brakes. There's still pretty much no fluid in the front brake lines, and the rears still have that gross old fluid. Not to mention the air bubbles we've introduced by disconnecting the master cylinder. It is worth mentioning that there are moving parts inside of a combination valve, and it is something else that can be rebuilt. It's less common to rebuild these, and in fact, I was not able to find a rebuild kit for this one. I'm sure there's one out there somewhere, but I wasn't actually able to find it. And since it seems to be working just fine, we'll just go ahead and keep using the combination valve as is. Thoroughly flushing the system with fresh fluid should help get a lot of the gunk out of there that might well be built up. From this point on, we need to keep a close eye on the master cylinder to make sure the reservoir does not go empty. We don't really have to worry about air from the brake lines making its way up into the master cylinder, but we do have to worry about the brake fluid in the reservoir completely draining out, because then we'd have to bleed it all over again. Then we'll reinstall the cap. We won't be clicking it fully into place, just sitting it on top of there to make sure we're not splashing around brake fluid. So we'll just get right to it and start bleeding the brakes. And we'll start with the longest brake line, the one going to the rear right brake drum. Since we had already broken loose the bleeder screws, they came loose nice and easy. We don't want to loosen the bleeder screw too much because we'll end up just drawing air into the system through the threads. You'll have to just go by feel since the threads vary on different bleeder screws, but somewhere between an eighth of a turn and a quarter turn will usually do it. If you pump the brake pedal and no fluid comes out, all you have to do is loosen it a little bit more until it does. I think we've bled brakes quite a few times on this channel before, but this time we're going to be using a slightly different method. First up, this new bleeder set we got has these little 90 degree fittings that easily attach onto bleeder screws. The other difference is we're going to be bleeding this one solo. And we'll get in the car and slowly pump the brakes a few times to get fluid started. The trick here, and these 90 degree fittings make it very easy, is to have the hose go up and then down into our little brake fluid container. There's no valve here, and that other fitting you see on the container isn't going to anything, it's really just for a vacuum bleed or to let air out as fluid fills the container. What we're doing is, well, using gravity. That vertical section of hose will act as our valve to allow air to get out of the system but prevent it from pulling it back in. And that's basically the idea of how most brake bleeding methods function. This particular setup just makes it really easy to bleed the brakes alone and not worry about opening and closing the bleeder valve. For what it's worth, I mostly got this brake bleeder set for those 90 degree fittings, and it was surprisingly cheap. And to jump ahead a little bit here, these brakes feel maybe the best out of any of my cars, so I'll definitely have to use this method again. Anyway, we're proceeding around the vehicle from the longest brake line to the shortest. So right rear, left rear, right front, left front. And each time we'll wait until we see the soy sauce stop flowing. What we're looking to see is that nice, almost clear, new fluid. In this case, since we introduced so much air into the brake lines, what we did was go around twice. The first time around, we were just looking for brake fluid flow and a minimal number of bubbles. We'd hook our brake fluid container up to each bleeder screw and slowly pump the brakes until they got noticeably more firm. And since I was doing this without a helper, I'd continuously check the brake fluid level in the reservoir as well as in the little container. 
and after the first run around, when all four corners were flowing brake fluid, we went around one more time. The second time, we were looking for that nice clear fluid and to have no bubbles coming out. Again, it can be somewhere between awkward and impossible to spot this while bleeding the brakes alone, but having a camera filming helps. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but you can pump the pedal a few times, then go and check the footage. And eventually, we have a brake pedal that feels very firm, nice clear fluid coming out from all four corners, and no more bubbles. Then we'll put a wrench on each bleeder screw and make sure they're all nice and tight. And with the brakes done for now, we can finally go around and reinstall the wheels. If you recall, we got new tires put on these wheels, but they've never actually been driven on. They've just been sitting in the garage waiting for us to finish the brakes. So we'll get all four of the wheels and new tires installed, get all the lug nuts in place and snugged down, reinstall the air intake hose and air cleaner assembly that we removed for easier access to the master cylinder, and we'll get the car off of the jack stands and set back onto the ground. And then we'll go around and torque all of the lug nuts down to 100 foot-pounds. It's uh, taken us a while to get through these last couple videos, but we finally managed to get the front brakes revamped. To reiterate, we'll definitely go back and replace the rear brake lines and wheel cylinders at some point, but that'll be a little farther down the line. As is, it's good enough that I feel confident driving the car, and that's the point we wanted to get to. There's still a lot, a lot, a lot of work to get through before we start driving the car around too much, but at least at this point it's pretty mechanically sound. And that's where we'll end this episode. Some work done, a good chunk of it in fact, but still plenty more to go. 